Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to wherever our listeners are in the world. I'm Fred Plotkin. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays, where we talk to leading musicians and creative people about their work, but also about inspiration. And I'm very honored today to have a musician who has inspired me a lot, Maestro Manfred Honeck, who I've never met. Those of you who have watched have seen me with artists who I know somewhat, but in this case, we have never even conversed until about 10 minutes ago. So Maestro, thank you for joining us. Welcome. It's a pleasure to see you, Fred. I know you are in Western Austria, not far from where you were born. Would you talk, the region is called the Vorarlberg, if I understand correctly. Would you talk about the environment, the physical environment and the sounds of Western Austria? Well, you know, um, I'm surrounded by mountains here. Um, it's very close to the Swiss border, actually one kilometer only. I was born, I would say in the mountains. It's uh, Lech is, um, is a very small village in Arlberg. That's because it's for Arlberg. It means before the Arlberg, before the mountain Arlberg. Um, yeah, this is the area. I, I have a wonderful uh, nature around me and um, I have the pleasure to spend my time with my family here. Um, it is fortunately a very, uh, very uh, wonderful weather. We had sun and, and, and I hear around my house always the birds singing. For a musician, as you know, we are always listening very clearly what, what they sing. Are they singing in tune or not? Uh, it's, it's a question uh, which we always want to answer. But nature is nature and um, I can so much relax and think about everything at the moment. As you know, I'm speaking to you from New York City and normally the noise here is so much, even though I live close to Central Park, that we don't hear nature, but right now with the lockdown, with the pandemic, there is much less traffic, there's much less of that regular New York City noise. And I must say that in the morning, in the night, I hear birds all the time now. I hear the lark early in the morning waking me up. I hear owls, I hear nightingales. I really feel like I'm in Schubert Leader right now rather than in New York City with its usual noise. And it's been wonderful. The air is cleaner, not as clean as where you are, but the bird song has been something just amazing to me that is not part of my usual lifestyle. Well, it is, uh, it is is wonderful, you know, the the, the the different types of birds, and when you see in the music, and hear it in the music, go back to one of the famous pieces like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, where he imitates the birds, or Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, and the um, end of the uh, the slow movement where he imitates actually the uh, the nightingale, you know, the cuckoo, and so on. So. There's, and, and of course, Mahler, and then all the uh, Dvorak, we had um, all these composers till now. Nature influences um, the composers and all musicians, myself enormously. It's without nature, I think I would have, have probably a completely different uh, view on the world. I once heard Rene Fleming say that the challenge for interpreters of art song, of lead, is that much of it is about nature and emotions from another time that may not necessarily be visible or recognizable to a contemporary audience. They may know about bird song and about um, longing and things like that, but it may not apply to today. So she was saying that a different kind of modern work may appeal to a moderate audience, at least in song and in, in symphonic music. Do you mm. find that the ideas, the values of back then, let's say in Schubert's time or Beethoven's time or Bruckner, Mahler, do they translate to today or is it through a filter? Absolutely. Um, I would say that uh, the birds and the nature doesn't change. We have changed. 
our habits have changed and we live a different life as um, as uh, 200 years ago in Schubert's time and Beethoven's time and Mahler's time. Um, so this is, uh, I would not say call it problem. It's just a, it's, it's, it's a fact. We have aeroplanes, we have cars in that times. They did not have that. We have a different, a very quick life. Um, how many times I'm in the airport. Uh, airport in time of Schubert is uh, um, uh, a word which did not exist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, uh, but it, it's what the animals did not change. In fact, it was actually a wonderful thing when I have recorded Beethoven's Sixth Symphony uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. Um, there is it, the spot I uh, explained to you before in the end of this uh, last movement. I was um, um, uh, checking the birds in YouTube and there were so different birds in Australia, in Europe, in America, and the same nightingale, they have the same sound the cuckoo has the same sound everywhere and it's i think it was always the same the, uh, the same so therefore beethoven heard the same birds as we hear today good point um because we've just met you don't know much about me you know that i lived in italy for a long time and when i did my private escape was always western austria and there's a little town that I went to in the province where Innsbruck is that was just high up in the mountains. And I, in the morning, would hear cowbells. And I would go to the barn where the cow had just been milked and purchased milk to drink in the morning, fresh milk, and walk in the meadows. And, and in the winter, the snow would be very high. The cows were still there, but they were eating hay and not grass. And still, it was so beautiful because it was so quiet. And Italy can be quiet compared to New York, but it was the stillness, and that's not a criticism, was such that I came to realize, in part, my appreciation and understanding of Austrian musicians. And Austria has been, a, people know me for Italy, but Austria has been a huge part of my life for most of my life, professionally, but also personally. Um, I know that when you were 10, you moved from your Alpine area in Western Austria to Vienna with your family, and you began to study. What was Vienna like for a boy who came from a small Alpine town in Western Austria? This is a good question. Actually, it was an adventure. You can imagine uh, living in a, uh, growing up in a small uh, village. Um, everybody was greeting each other. We, uh, we know each other. And I, as you said, you know, I was um, um, the whole summer in the mountains um, and and and, uh, um, and on the grass, and we had no light, electric light. It was actually really natural light, and everybody who sh uh, should experience that one time, too, that um, that a light. Um, electric uh, traffic light, you know, and and uh, at least at, um, how you say this um, artificial light. Um, um, it has, it's, it's, it's wonderful to experience that. We, know, we see uh, in the night better. But if the sun goes down um, and then is suddenly darkness in the mountains, what kind of a power this darkness combined with the silence? It, I only can uh, uh, imagine if you uh, hear that and, 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 and experience that. This it's, is such, such an amazing power which influences you um, in the music. Well, with this saying, um, how we grew up coming to uh, the city of Vienna, suddenly you have that, um, the, the train um, on the street, you have a lot of traffic, you hear the police. You ne we never heard the police signal, never, never. And I remember one thing that in the first weeks, I was greeting everybody on the street. <laughs> and. I was so shocked that uh, the people turned around and didn't say anything. I thought uh, the people in the city must be very nasty and very angry. And so, well, um, well, 
I stopped doing that. <laughs> it was a completely different uh, world for me. Um, um, of course, we were longing to be in the nature, but I must also say the decision of my father to take all his kids in that time, we, we, we were nine kids, but in that time we were seven, uh, to take all the sevens to Vienna uh, with one for one reason, that all of them should um, study music in the in the best school in Austria, in the Vienna, Vienna Academy, in the Hochschule. Um, so um, I am so thankful um, for my father that he take took this decision and also having no money. We had simply no money. Now remember that we were um, uh, living with all the seven and my father, my, my mother did not uh, live anymore um, in, in, in a, in a two, uh, two room apartment. So can you imagine how that works with, with seven uh, kids and, and one father? We had only, I, I think it was only Mm, probably a year we were there and the neighbors um, uh, they moved out um, because they could not stand the playing the violin here the violin cello and all these things <laughs> so what they poor the, the poor neighbors but then we moved uh, uh, to a bigger uh, apartment but to have the courage um, as a, a, as a father to take all the kids under these circumstances to the capital city of Austria, just that they can learn the, uh, the instrument, I think um, this is something which I will uh, always keep in my mind how, how grateful I am that I had this father. In which neighborhood, or as it's called in Vienna, the Bezirk, did you live in and grow up in? Well, <laughs> it is actually, uh, you, it will be funny. Um, the, uh, the the apartment where we uh, finally lived was Johann Strauss Gasse. Okay. It was the the street where Johann Strauss passed away. Yeah. So I was almost every day walking on on the, uh, passed by the uh, uh, the house where he passed away. Of course, it was destroyed in the in the uh, in the Second World War, so they built it up again. Um, but uh, it's it's funny that it was just um, um, by accident uh, and, 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 and a composer's street. Yeah? I don't go to many cemeteries in the world unless I know someone who's there, but I have spent a fair amount of time in the Zentral Friedhof in Vienna, the main cemetery, because like the cemetery in St. Petersburg and also the Cimitero Monumentale in Milan, it's full of musicians. And it's very interesting to see the reverence that most of these musicians received there. Um, I, I was honored to know and work with Leonie Riesenek. And when I go to Vienna, I visit her grave there. Mm -hmm. um, the one main composer apart from Mozart about whom we know, who is not buried in that cemetery is Gustav Mahler, who is up in the 20th near Grinzing and it's a very lovely cemetery where he is and his wife Alma is not next to him, but a few spaces away. Um, there is no city in the world, not even St. Petersburg or Milan, that holds its musicians in the same status as Vienna, even though they gossip and disagree about them. But growing up in that environment in which you could refer to any number of musicians by their single name and everyone knew who it was. How was that enriching? Was that challenging? Was that special? It is special and it's today special because Vienna is the city of culture. Vienna is the city of music and it is, you, you see that every time. When we talked about before um, my first um, impressions of Vienna, when I went out, Johann Strauss, then suddenly there was a, a house, it says Dvorak was here. Then it goes to the next, Brahms was here. And you know what I was surprised? Vivaldi died in Vienna. Yeah. You know? So it's, and, and, but Schubert was there. Beethoven, you hear, see a lot of um, houses where Beethoven lived because he changed a lot. 
the apartments, you know, then then Bruckner uh, and, and and Gustav Mahler. What a it, what a treasure this city is, and 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 the city knows that. And I think that the people are so um, uh, so good that they still um, support the culture. They still go to the Musikverein, go to the Staatsoper, go to the Volksoper, um, and and the Konzerthaus, and they they are really uh, taking part in the cultural life. It seems to be that Austria lives uh, mostly from culture. And um, and from these wonderful um, composers. By the way, not all of them there were Viennese. One of the rare is actually Schubert. Schubert. Beethoven came from Bonn. Mozart came from Salzburg. Um, Mahler came from uh, from Tschechien, um, Kaliste, and uh, and so on. So real, uh, but they met each other in in. Um, in, in uh, uh, Vienna. And I think this inspiration to, uh, to know that, is, at least for me, it was so wonderful to know, wow, here was Brahms. I was sitting on his chair once um, and saw this in the Musikverein where Bruckner was teaching. Gustav Mahler was one of his students. And then you stay there where all the famous conductors were, um, were conducting in the Musikverein. It's actually a feeling. I don't want to be so much nostalgic. Uh, please don't misunderstand me. We are still living our time. We have to go to our time. Um, I, I love this, uh, 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 this combination of, of modern time and reflecting and experience the, um, the great works of, of this fantastic composer. But when you come to Vienna, I will not miss uh, the Sachertorte, by the way. It's, uh, it's very important to me. I eat it at Demel. Is that okay? Of course. It's <laughs> <laughs> but actually, my favorite cake in Vienna is um, it's made of mon of poppy seed. It has strawberry preserve, just a little bit of strawberry, and a dark chocolate glaze. And you find it at the Kunsthistorisches Museum only on Thursdays. So, never. What, what is the name of that? Uh, I call it Mon Torta, but I don't know if that Mon being poppy seed. Of course. But it's yeah. only on Thursdays. It's magnificent. So, they need a um, week to, to bake it. Or... Yeah, exactly. Or to <laughs> gather all the poppy seeds. Um, Poppy seeds, by the way, having arrived in Vienna in 1683 with the Turks, who also brought uh, filo dold that became strudel, and they left bags of coffee. And the Austrian army defeated the Turkish army. The Turks left, but what stayed behind was the coffee, the poppy seeds, the filo dold, and that created the great Viennese cafe tradition and the baking and so on. Uh, the kipfel, which are little crescents, uh, actually came from Turkey and they were the, or not Turkey, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And these were the crescents. Maestro, you don't know, I studied at the Austrian State Cooking Academy in, on Judenplatz in Vienna. I am so impressed, Fred, that I <laughs> have to talk to you now in 2020 and get to know all the Viennese tradition and secrets. Actually, I, it's one of my passions is Austrian and Viennese food. But I want to ask you a question about um, something I've never been able to ask anyone else before. It's your unique combination of factors. Many young musicians and musicians play both in the orchestra of the Vienna State Opera and the Wiener Philharmonic or the Vienna Philharmonic. You played viola. But you're the first person I've spoken to who did that, who then became a conductor. When you were under the maestros in both orchestras, which is really the same orchestra, but two different divisions, were you thinking about becoming a conductor? Did you observe them and draw from them as a potential conductor or were you thinking as a viola player? Well, before I was winning the audition, 
I was already conducting. So I had already uh, something uh, in mind that I might be a conductor. But I must say, I was so thankful when I um, was uh, accepted uh, and offered the job um, in the Vienna Staatsoper in that time. Because you, firstly, you have to be a member of the Vienna Staatsoper. And then three years later, you can be a member of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra is a private institution, actually. It's, it's um, not funded by the state. It's really private. And all the managers are musicians. So you, the, the leader, the CEO, is a first violin player at the moment, um, and the managing uh, director is uh, a double bass player, and so on. It's 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 a very fascinating um, actually structure what the Vienna Philharmonic had. But uh, when I was winning, I was thinking myself, this is so wonderful to be in this orchestra and to play orchestra uh, uh, operas um, under the best. Um, uh, conductors, um, fantastic singers, and then also go on tour with the orchestra, playing the, um, the repertoire, um, the concert repertoire. I was so thankful and so happy, actually. But uh, I was conducting um, a youth orchestra, and, um, and suddenly, uh, a manager came to me and asked me, "Could you? Do you want to be a part of a competition of the Vienna Chamber Orchestra?" So I did, and I won uh, this competition. And um, so I got then invitation to uh, as a guest conductor. And every time when uh, I conducted there, um, I got a re-invitation. So you can imagine that it is not easy when you have uh, to fulfill your your job. You have to do your um, your, your service there, and you have to to play. And that was not so so small. It is play opera and um, and concerts, go on tour. And by the way, I played also a lot of chamber music um, as well. Um, so I got a lot of re-invitations as a conductor, and and I knew in my heart uh, there will the time come where I finally have to to decide: do I want to leave this wonderful orchestra, or do I want to take the step um, um, uh, to be a conductor? And when Alexander Pereira, who um, who was uh, in that time in 1991 uh, the the director of the Wiener Konzerthaus, he was offered a job in the Opera House in Zurich. And he came to me and asked me, Manfred, do you want to go with me to Zurich? In that moment, I knew immediately that I have to do it now. It was, it was, it was so crystal clear, but of course, I was very careful. I said uh, to him, give me time, give me at least two, three months. I don't want to decide now because this is a big step. I had three kids already and family and, you know, and an income as a conductor. You, you, not, you not really have in the first years of, um, 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 a stable income. So I asked then Claudio Abado, where I have been um, 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 assistant. I asked Lenny for an one hour in the um, in the conductor room of the Musikverein. He gave me um, uh, some ideas. What is about conductor? It was wonderful. I asked Jimmy Levine. I asked so many other people. What do you think? Shall I do? Because to leave the Vienna Philharmonic is, it's, 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 you know, it's very, very rare that people leave this orchestra. But I got the courage, and um, and I left the orchestra in 1991, um, and um, yeah, and I love to be conduct as well. What were the kind of ideas that Leonard Bernstein gave you? Well, of course, he uh, referred to his own life, you know, how it is, and to be convinced to be a conductor. Um, but in the end, he said, Manfred, if you feel uh, that, the, uh, that you should not do this, then don't do it. But if you feel, um, uh, if, you, uh, if you feel do it, then do it. But he said also, don't regret. Don't regret the next offer will come. He was like a father, you know, he's, he, he um, to me, somehow he, um, 
he knew exactly if I say no, in the next moment, I will regret that, you know, and he knew it that because he probably had um, give these advices to many others uh, conductors as well. He knew the human soul, soul so good and I was so thankful because when I left this, um, uh, this uh, room afterwards, I said to myself, hmm, he's right. I don't want to regret it. You know, I will say yes, I will go. He gave me the courage to do it. I met him when I was six and part of a group of children who were his control group for his young people's concerts. My mother worked at Lincoln Center. My dad was a musician. My stepfather worked at Columbia Records where Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic recorded. So I was part of that circle as a child. And he was such a natural teacher. He was a wonderful teacher and really loved children so that in the middle of a rehearsal of the Philharmonic, he would turn over his left shoulder and speak to us children. This is what Brahms was thinking about at this moment. Listen to what Brahms did and he would have the orchestra, <clears throat> excuse me, play something again so yeah. that we would fully understand. He was so much the teacher and the mentor and uh, I knew him and really till the rest of his life until he died. And um, mm -hmm. an amazing person in addition to being an amazing artist. I must now, tell you one, one story, uh, that's, if you don't mind. Uh, I have a lot of stories, but it was uh, just too long. But uh, you know, when, uh, when the Vene Philharmonic was um, invited to um, uh, be in the opening week of the concert house in Berlin, which was still was the DDR, so the, the, uh, the East German. Um, we had a rehearsal um, and uh, there were a lot of young people um, were there, but not in the hall. So um, Lenny stopped then and said, where are the young people? I saw them out, so they want to come in. And he found out that they did not allow them to come into the rehearsal. So Lenny said, I will not conduct if these people are not come, uh, come in. You know, he had the courage. He was uh, also, uh, 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 he had really, to, he always gave a statement and somehow. It was so wonderful that he took care of people, of young people who wanted to see him, gave time. Look at me, I mean, I was a viola player and, and uh, wanted to conduct. He gave me an hour to talk about my own problems. You know, so it, it, isn't it wonderful? That's the reason why I, myself and he's one or the reason why I always think um, that I want to give also my time for other people. Another story was that uh, uh, we were a little bit shocked when uh, Lenny came to the rehearsal, there was young people in a Busikfren in Vienna and suddenly he started to say, okay, let's play a scale. Mm -hmm. What do you mean with scale? Oh, tone lighter. Yes, let's do a scale. Which which uh, which key? Uh, G major. Yeah? So and how many octaves? And so, so uh, we played then uh, five minutes scales like students, mm -hmm. till um, the chairman of the Vienna Phonics stood up and said, very angry, Maestro, it's enough now. It's enough now. <laughs> but you know, to let the the, the famous Vienna Philharmonic to play like students the scale in front of the young people, I we felt you know I was laughing you know because I thought it, no no other conductor did that you know, uh, so he <laughs> was so uh, I I was laughing but many people were of course angry because we said. What, what 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 does it mean? You know what what do you want to do now and so on. No, oh, it's good. Let's do quick and let's do soft and so on. So, uh, uh, in, so, in my preparation for this conversation, I read many times that you feel a very strong affinity and respect for Carlos Kleiber, the conductor. Yeah. Um, you worked with him, I would imagine. You knew him. What can you tell us about him and his? his impact on you, but also his impact on music? Well, um, I was a substitute when I first time um, uh, played under the pattern of Carlos Kleiber. It, I was a violin player actually in the, the second violin. And we went on tour to Mexico 
I'm going to what or play Beethoven seven symphony. We played Schubert third, and then it's the, the repertoire which he he had a small repertoire. It's, it's always repeated almost the, um, the same. I was so impressed, firstly, by his conducting technique. He could impress with his hand, um, uh, express it with his hand all the nuances. The timing was absolutely right. The spirit was 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 really perfect. That's the first thing. The second thing is his rehearsal technique was enormous. He never said to us, the boring, are you too loud, you too soft, you too quick, you too slow. And so these, these things what orchestral musicians normally don't like to hear so much. They hear it anyway. They accept it. Of course, it has to be together. But Carlos Kleiber was never really interested only to be together. This technical thing did not really interest him. Of course, he was interested in Beethoven Seventh Symphony, for example, the rhythm of the first uh, movement, yum, pa dun 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 so somebody, Sometimes we played dun 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 a little bit lazy. No, no, said, no, 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 play this dun 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 Then he went even to the timpani and showed it how he wants to have this, you know. But he always gave us pictures, some images, um, how to play, um, a, a certain spot, for example, um, uh, Beethoven five in the last movement, there is the bassoon plays, you know, do, ri, ro, ri, ro, do, ri. this is a wonderful and famous in the coda, do, ri, ro, ri, do, do, ri. Um, and um, uh, we had uh, really great uh, bassoon players in the Vienna Philharmonic, they are teaching um, also in the high school, in the music school, and they had always ties because they, after the service they had to go to, to teach, so and then it was uh, common to have um, a tie. Suddenly, Kleiber said, no, you have to play a little bit more, more fresh, more energy, you know, um, so we repeated that, but he was not satisfied, and then suddenly he said, you must play this like a monkey family is coming on. A monkey family? You know, this they felt so offended. We were all laughing, but how is it? And they said, yeah. And then he said to the oldest one, and you, you are the mayor of the, of the monkeys. You're the <laughs> overboss of the monkeys. So we, since then, you know, when we played the concert, uh, it was somehow feeling when it came to the spot, now I, have to, I play this like a monkey family. And since I conduct this symphony, it's always the monkey family. It's so in the head. And he was, Carlos Klemmer was a genius um, to, uh, um, to get the musicians into the music with a story. And this, uh, beside the conducting, beside the interpretation, of course, which, which was wonderful, but this was so different from all of the others. And that's the reason why I, I tried to study him um, as, as much as I could. You mentioned that he maintained a small repertory. One of my very favorite singers of all time, who is not gone that long, but people either know him or they don't, was the tenor Alfredo Kraus, who I adored as an artist, as a man. And Alfredo intentionally had a very small repertory of roles, but he refined them through the years. And he died at 69. His voice was still beautiful. And at the age of 65, for example, he sang the Duke in Rigoletto completely musically, dramatically, plausibly. He was handsome at 65. And I could look at Alfredo Krauss' performances of the Duke, of Verter, of, of whatever roles he did, and live in them on the recordings and the videos. Kleiber did the same thing, that he really maintained a small repertory of music that he lived with constantly. And, and to me, that's very impressive, but I also wonder how do you decide which ones you live with and which ones don't merit attention? Well, I mean, everything is emotion in music. You know, you have to have an affinity to the music, what you do. And uh, Kleiber is, um, uh, he was um, extreme, uh, in, in, in all the wills, you know, he wanted to have uh, the best result, you know. Um, we have to know that uh, Kleiber had, had a big repertoire. I mean, he conducted the operettas, you know, Lustig Witwe and all these uh, unfamous operettas in Berlin when he started. He conducted also in Zurich, in the Opera House, everywhere, um, pieces which, uh, which he was not famous for. But then 
in the 70s, he decided, I will concentrate on those uh, symphonies and those music which say a lot to me, which means a lot to me, and keep them. The thing is, and I really experience it myself also, um, the more, uh, if, you, if you conduct a piece, and knowing that you have studied the piece very, very good, but if you conduct the piece the first time, it's somehow you get some new elements, you learn something more. If you get conduct a second time, it's not the same. If you conduct it a third, fourth, and hundred times, it um, it um, always changes your view on the piece. And the, I, for me personally, um, I love this system to concentrate um, on the on, on some of the pieces where you really can tell um, the musicians more secrets. And the more you conduct, and believe it or not, if I open the score um, of let's say Mala first symphony, um, which I have conducted so many times. I always find new things. And you ask yourself, why didn't you find it before? I, I really studied every note that you did not really um, uh, recognize that. Every conductor has the same problem. Tohnani said when he was celebrating his 80 years uh, anniversary, uh, birth year, um, he um, uh, said the same, it's, it's incredible. He still opens the score and finds things which he have not, has, has not discovered before. What means you grow with the piece so enormously. And that's the reason why might be in, in, uh, Carlos Kleiber could tell you so many things, so many new things which we did not hear or experience. Um, uh, this is the best what you can have. And I think it's also right to do because uh, um, when you grow with a piece and you have this experience, a uh, long life experience, um, musicians probably will want to hear that and the audience also hear that. There is a difference. There is always a difference when you hear the, um, when you conduct a, a piece the first time or you have it done 100,000 times. I had the opportunity to work with Carlos Kleiber once. Um, oh, he yeah. had a reputation, I don't, I didn't experience that myself, of being either difficult or very removed, very private, you don't talk to him, you let him be. And I can tell you the dates. It was December and January in early February of 1988. And he was conducting for his debut La Boheme at the Met. Five performances, Morella Franey, Luciano Pavarotti, Barbara Daniels, Thomas Hampson in the famous Zeffirelli production. And I had decided that I was going to leave the Met to go work in Europe with the last performance of this Kleiber Bohem on February 6, 1988. Because I had had no vacation in years, I went to Argentina in December and early January to work and but also relax and enjoy Buenos Aires and the Tatra Cologne and so forth. And when I came back, I had not received the memorandum saying no one is to talk to Maestro Kleiber. And he was allowed to walk wherever he wanted. You did not ask him for an ID. You just let Maestro Kleiber go wherever he wanted and no one could talk to him. And my habit as performance manager was to meet all of the artists and tell them if they need anything, I'm here to help. And when I sought him out, he said, do you know you're the first person to talk to me? <laughs> he said, I heard that the Met was such a nice, warm family and people are polite, but they look down when I walk by and they don't talk to me except for the artists I'm working with. And, and the orchestra musicians are very nice, but he said, they don't give back because I think they're afraid of me. And I said, well, I'm not afraid of you. He said, where have you been? I said, I was in Argentina. And he said, I lived in Argentina because his father, Eric Kleiber, left during the war and brought the young Carlos to Argentina. And he had a lot of his early training and life experience there. And so each night he and I would go out for dinner for steak often because he liked Argentine steak and we didn't quite have that in New York. And we would talk about music. And at the end, there was a party for me on February 6th at Pavarotti's house and he came 
and he thanked me for making him feel welcome. And he said, I'm sorry you won't be at the Met, but I hope now to come back to the Met because I've discovered an artistic home here. Mm -hmm. And you're different. Was he, I, I found him a warm person. Do you know of this other side that was considered very forbidding and very distant? Oh, yeah, I mean, he was so nice and so funny to the orchestra, really. As mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was a pleasure to listen to him and, and we felt so embraced by him, actually. I must say, I, I, I could not really understand these things, but um, he was also very sensitive on some issues. You know, he didn't want to have um, managers around him. He didn't like them, you know, and, and, and all the... Um, behaviors and sometimes you know might be people in the earlier times uh, behaved very badly um to, uh, or you know he, he he didn't want he wanted to be a human and he was a simple human that experienced the same that in on the tour for example he um had uh, also invited the stage director um for dinner you know so he, he, he he i was traveling actually with him in the bus from Mexico City to, to, to Guanajuato. Mm -hmm. I was sitting behind him, you know, as a young substitute. But I thought myself, why does Maestro not traveling with a limousine or with a private car to this 200 kilometer? I don't know how, how far it is. Um, he was, he wanted to, 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 to um, drive with a musician. And I know a lot of other stories also that he really took care of, of people um, and, and, and man, he was crazy in, in a way also that he exaggerated things, you know, this, um, the, when he uh, should um, conduct the, or the director of the, of the Bayerische um, Staatsoper asked him, you know, can you come back, come back and do Rosenkavalier and so on. Uh, so they were walking on the street because he didn't want to go in the office. He hated the offices. Uh, so, and, uh, and suddenly, so they were talking on the street and walking and, um, and suddenly um, um, uh, he stopped and he saw an Audi, um, the car, a famous, a very expensive one, and said, okay, if you if you buy me exactly this car, I will conduct. Isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy? This is, uh, uh, and unfortunately the, the owner of the car, uh, he was a, a, a classic fan. So he got his um, uh, Audi then. Um, but just to, uh, you know, this kind of, he, he was, playing a little bit games sometimes. You know, how can we do this, you know? And then and, and he was not the most cheap, uh, cheapest uh, conductor in the world. His uh, fees were uh, astronomic actually. So, but everybody wanted him and um, I understand why he was great. Well, our Idagio listeners know that each guest I have provides us with a list of musical performances found at Idagio that you find particularly meaningful, and they will be attached to this broadcast. Um, I would say that most of them are obviously masterpieces, very mainstream, the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, the Bruckner Ninth Symphony, the Mahler First Symphony that you mentioned, the Dvorak Violin Concerto with Anne-Sophie Mutter that you're conducting, uh, the Mozart Coronation Mass, a waltz by Johann Strauss. Is it junior or senior? I'm uh, sure. It's junior. Junior, that's junior. what I thought. And uh, Fritz Wunderlich singing Lehar. Now, I, I could ask you about all of these. I will mention that you are my second guest to name the Coronation Mass. Uh, Ferruccio Forlanetto named it last week. Mm -hmm. He performed in that with Karian at the Vatican. And um, he found it, it's interesting to me that that's the trending piece of music so far. Um, you mentioned the Mahler, the Dvorak Violin Concerto. To me, although Dvorak is famous, he's still an underrated composer. I, I think he's magnificent. I, being a New Yorker, he lived here in New York City mm -hmm. and he taught and he conducted and performed at Carnegie Hall, the famous New World Symphony, which is really symphony from the New World, mm -hmm. was composed for the New York Philharmonic and people are able to study his score at the archives of the Philharmonic. But 
the one I want to ask you about is Anton Bruckner. You've conducted the symphony number no. nine. You've conducted, I imagine, more than that. I believe that that work is very close to you. Tell me why, please. Well, um, there are a lot of reasons why I put Bruckner on, on the list also. But um, um, first of all, uh, we, we talked about uh, growing with a composer and conducting that. Sometimes people think you can uh, conduct Bruckner only if you have white hairs. Now you see, I have white hairs, so it's the time to conduct uh, <laughs> Bruckner. And, uh, uh, um, but uh, there is a, with Bruckner a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, they put him all mostly in a in a in a spiritual corner. They say he was Catholic and he was um, uh, uh, organist, so everything has to sound like in a church or like an organ. Um, and um, this is partly also right. He was a Catholic and a devoted Catholic. He was a, a wonderful, uh, faithful uh, human. Um, and he was an organist, of course. But the other side is completely ignored, in my opinion, uh, in Bruckner's life. It's his love for the Austrian folks music. We have to know he was um, uh, conducting a, a choir. He was playing viola and violin. Um, he was playing himself in weddings, on weddings, playing the Strauss music and Lanna and all this Austrian old folk music. And and I think uh, it is so important in um, in his symphonies also to understand this background. So uh, one of the reasons why this uh, Bruckner Nine Symphony of the recording of uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra um, um, was um, very successful is uh, to highlight uh, also the this um, this folk music elements, but of course the spiritual in this especially in this symphony his last symphony which was not finished um, uh, is uh, dominated by by the spiritual aspect especially the third movement where he looks more or less in the eternity and looks also so far in the future in the, in the 20th century um, it, it makes this piece uh, so special but also a lot of wonderful uh, Viennese like melodies Viennese like um, transitions um, this is uh, this is for this is for, for me uh, makes Bruckner much much more um, more meaningful in my opinion more universal I would say I've sung the praises of Vienna as you have. He didn't have, Bruckner did not have the easiest time in Vienna. In his era, one of the dominant musical figures was named Edward Hanslick, who was a critic. And he was a good friend of Johannes Brahms who lived in Vienna. And everything we know about Brahms was that he was a very generous figure and, and warm and Contradictory, we know the story of him and Robert Schumann and Clara Schumann, which is wonderful to explore. But apparently Hanslick did not like that Bruckner greatly admired Wagner and dedicated the third symphony to Wagner because either you were of the line of Wagner list, we could say Berlioz, or of the more Mendelssohn, Schumann, Brahms line. I think it's possible to be both and to love both, but um, kind of like Hector Berlioz in Paris, he didn't have admirers. And it was similar for Bruckner in Vienna, in my knowledge. That's you true. It affected him? Yeah, absolutely, it affected him enormously. But uh, a genie like uh, Bruckner is not uh, uh, musically not really uh, disconnected to that. He wanted to, he had a, such a great will and he wanted to do this uh, music like he hears it, like he wants to, to hear it. The life was big, but you know, he respected Brahms very much. Of course, they were a little bit in competition, uh, but you know, when Bruckner died, um, the funeral mass was actually in, in the Karlskirche. And it's said to be that Brahms was standing in the back behind, behind a column. You know, uh, you know, it was actually beautiful that they are also honoring this. Uh, the, the case was a little bit Hanslick, you know, the Neudeutsche school, uh, the new German school and the traditional school. That's what, what is better. Now we know much, much more. There were 
uh, enormous fans uh, of Bruckner who hated Brahms, and of some uh, fans who hated Bruckner. Um, it was like in a football club, you know, it's still in Vienna we have Rapid and Austria Wien, two football clubs, um, they don't like each other. Fortunately, they are not violent uh, uh, that much, but it, it's a little bit like, a, probably it has to be the Bramsianer and the Brucknerianer in that time, so that you can imagine uh, uh, what kind of explosive energy it was around in the Musikverein. When Bruckner conducted, uh, some people went out, you know, some musicians left, you know, this music is not good. And so later on, they loved it. Now they are proud to have him. We have to conclude because Adagio has a live concert coming up in about 10 minutes. I, I have to mention one other source of inspiration, apart from wonderful musicians such as yourselves. Um, I'm open-minded about most things, but I will say that the best apricots, Marillen, in the world are in Austria, in the, from the Wachau Valley, but not only, and they're coming into blossom now. And I was supposed to be in Austria this summer for work, and I envy you having all of those Marillen, those apricots to put in jams and zaft and juices and strudel and so on. So please, if you have to remain there for this period, keep up the great work, but also eat a few marillin for me, Maestro. Thank Mr. you very much. Just got uh, visit my sister and she brought me uh, marillin jam. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it made my day. <laughs> Enjoy it. Share it with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And listeners, next week we have the British soprano Rosalind Plowright. Please join us. Have a good week. Enjoy music on Idajo and in life. And thank you, Manfred Honeck. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.